can just take a pin. Now let's go to collider detectors. Now, collider detectors I call shoebox detectors. The reason why I call them shoebox detectors is because they really cover a four pi solid angle. You start out with, and they're, they're like an onion, they are layered detectors. So first you start out with a detector, so right in the center of the detector is where the interaction takes place. So say you have a proton or an antiproton collide. And right in the center, you start out with a detector that very accurately measures the trajectory of particles. And here, even, you have detectors that can measure the lifetimes of particles. Some of the particles that we produce live for a relatively long time. They live, say, 10 to the minus 12 seconds. For us, that's long enough. Because if they travel at the speed of light, that means they travel about you know, a few millimeters, which is enough for us to detect that. But you have to, be, you have, to have resolution enough to be able to distinguish a particle that originated from this point and this point, but these two points are separated by a few millimeters. Then you have normally a big tracker um, to measure the momentum of particles. For the momentum, you need a magnet, so there's a magnet. Then you have uh, calorimeters to measure the total energies, and then something to measure muons. So we have two collider detectors here. D0 and CDF. Interaction takes place right here in the middle. And this, I, can, I think, indicates to you why I call these shoebox detectors. They're really covered from all on all sides. Now, we're going to do the following. You know that the top fork was discovered here at the lab in 1995. So what we're going to do now is we're going to ask ourselves, what do we need to do to discover a top word? Okay? So, first, there's a model, a theoretical model, that says that top words are produced in pairs, a top and an anti-top, and the top word decays 100% into a W that can either decay into uh, two quarks or a lepton and a neutrino, and into a B quark. That's what the theory tells us. Because they are lighter. Okay, a B quark, we know, lives very long. A B quark lives about uh, 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So what we're looking for, the telltale signature of a B quark, is what we call a displaced vertex. So here is the primary interaction where the proton and the antiproton collided. You produce this B quark, the B quark lives for a while, 10 to the minus 12 seconds, a few seconds, and then it decays. So if you are able to distinguish this point from this decay point, you use this to what we call a tag a B quark. Say, so, well, this was a B quark. Now, how do you do that? As I just told you, you need something that has the best phenomenal precision. The best phenomenal precision to measure particle trajectories are silicon detectors. So here is a silicon detector from D0 that we have. Interaction point is right in the middle. And you can see layers and layers and layers of uh, silicon that measure particle trajectories. This detector has, by the way, uh, about a million readout channels that are read out constantly at a rate of every 396 nanoseconds, if you have to to measure the particle trajectory. So CDF also has a silicon detector, and they have a very cute one <laughs> that goes very close to the beam pipe, at 2.2 centimeters to the beam pipe. Um, so again, the closer you get to this point, the better off you are, if you want to measure just sizes of a millimeter. So this is the penny, so these tend to be very small. So here you see these silicon sensors on the support structure. This is the support structure. And you can, this sets again the scale, the quarter. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the silicon sensors mounted on the support structure. And again, you go out. 
you populate this barrel of barrels. Here's one barrel completed. Then you combine multiple barrels. You build them up into the whole structure. The further out you go, you know, the more manageable they get. And in the end, you have full systems like this that you put together. Then, surrounded by that, are tracking systems. The two detectors follow two completely different approaches. One uses scintillating fibers, so that the fibers exactly like this, but are scintillating. And then they have doublets, so this is a picture of an event where you can see the particles, the trajectories that they reconstruct. CDF uses a drift chamber, exactly what we discussed in the first hour. So there are eight layers of chambers, and these are all planes of wires. So if you look into this chamber, and you can actually see this chamber in the CDF hall, it's one of them in one of your tours, so you can actually see all these wires. Yep. I noticed how most of the people there are wearing hair nets. That's right. Because I don't think you want a hair in here. If there's a hair in there, it shorts the thing out, and you're dead in the water. Okay, so we got these tracking chambers. So this is then how it looks like. So this is an event that we recorded. You see all these particle tracks. And then you can zoom in. So this is five centimeters. And you can see that there are these displaced vertices. So if you zoom in some more, you can see that here was the primary interaction. And here was a secondary interaction and another one. So this then we associate with B quarks. So here was one from the top and one from the anti-top quark. And the other thing you notice, the scale here is five millimeters. And this is actually where there are no detectors, right? So you have to extrapolate these tracks to within the beam pump. Then this thing is surrounded by calorimeters. As I said, calorimeters are generally destructive. So you want to absorb the total energy. And calorimeter is normally subdivided into an electromagnetic section followed by a hadronic section. And there are two types. One is homogeneous, where there's just one piece, normally of a crystal, where you absorb the full energy, or what we call sampling calorimeters, where you have a detector followed by an absorber. And it's only the signal in the detector that you measure. And the absorber you use to stop the point. Yeah. Okay. For the homogeneous calorimeters, do you, have, do you get the crystals naturally, or do you actually have to make them? No, we have to make them. You know, uh, this is a lead tungstate crystal for the CMS experiment at CERN. It's a sister laboratory in Geneva. And they needed, I think, 13,000 of these. And they were all grown in <coughs> Russia. So, with these sampling calorimeters, both the CDF and these here use a sampling calorimeter, and they again employ different techniques for the detector. So, T0 uses as detection medium liquid arc. So, the absorber is uranium, and then the active medium is liquid argon. And this is a picture of their calorimeter. You can see they become rather sizable systems. They have three of these calorimeters, central and two in the ends. And again, the interaction point is right here in the middle. CDF uses scintillators as the active medium. And again, the, the light that is produced is then guided with these wavelength shifting fibers to a photomultiplier. Okay, then you end the system with a muon tracking system. Those muons are minimum ionizing particles, and they normally you know, escape the detector. <coughs> so you complement these detectors with large area muon chambers that surround the whole detector. And D0 has actually quite a, a, a nice muon system. <coughs> 